Now, let's focus on cybersecurity. Some consumers are expressing concern about the security of their devices. This follows, of course, publication by anti-secrecy group WikiLeaks. Of what it says, a thousand of pages of internal CIA discussions about hacking techniques that have been used over several years, specifically between 2013 and 2016. Others, however, are not surprised by these claims. The discussion transcripts show that CIA hackers could get into, into iPhones and Android devices and other gadgets in order to capture text and voice messages before they encrypted with sophisticated software. Although not confirmed, several contractors and private cybersecurity experts say the material does appear to be genuine. Really what it comes down to is you have to choose what to use, what not to use, and, and that if you do use something, you're going to be vulnerable. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people say, well, if you've got nothing to hide, it shouldn't matter. But the point is, is not that you're hiding something, just that you want to have a private conversation. You should be able to have a private conversation. I think the CIA has actually been doing its job. If you think about it, we, the U.S. government gives the CIA billions of dollars a year and part of what they're supposed to be doing is spying, not on Americans, but on everybody else. So I think that, in fact, it's quite reasonable that they have these kinds of tools. Uh, as long as they are used appropriately and within U.S. law and not against U.S. citizens, uh, why should you be surprised? Let's dig deep into this topic. Uh, Daniel Rangers joins us live in Washington, D.C. tonight with uh, the perspective from the United States. In studio with me as well is uh, Tyrus Kamau, the CEO of Euclid, a firm which focuses on cybersecurity in East Africa. Daniel, let's start with you, though. Um, we've seen reports today attributing the leak uh, of these documents to former CIA contractors. What more do we know about how this leak occurred? Well, it's very common for people with high security clearance to go and work for uh, some of the, these contractors. You know, uh, the, the original leak by Edward Snowden, although he'd been in the NSA, was actually during a period when he had been working for Booz Allen Hamilton, a consulting firm. So uh, some U.S. Uh, agents speaking to Reuters on the condition of anonymity have said it's likely uh, that a CIA contractor of that sort may have leaked this information. And they also point to the fact that they don't think the Russians, for example, have used any of these cyber weapons. They don't detect any use of it, which would point to a leak um, that uh, stayed within uh, the WikiLeaks and possibly some others in the intelligence community. Uh, but we don't have any definitive conclusions, but you can be sure that investigators at the FBI and CIA are raking through the personal details of many of the contractors and officials working on these programs. Indeed. Uh, one quick follow-up question to that. The White House has said uh, that it, the president is quite concerned about these particular leaks. But is the anger we're seeing from the White House right now driven more by the fact that these data acquisition techniques are now pretty much out in the open and that has compromised a slight edge in foreign intelligence collection? Well, you have to ha understand these comments in domestic terms because uh, earlier this week, Donald Trump tweeted that he felt as if uh, President Obama had authorized a wiretap of him and his um, closest aides uh, during the campaign and after the campaign because they had suspicions that there were direct links with Russia. So uh, there is a concern among the Trump administration about a deep state within Washington and the agencies involved, which includes concerns that the CIA agents or officials have been leaking information to damage uh, Donald Trump and uh, the White House as a whole. So the fact that now uh, you've got WikiLeaks saying, well, look, the, you've leaked this information that's absolutely essential to national security, uh, don't you think you have a leaky sh ship? Don't you think this is damaging to everybody concerned? I think that actually plays into the hands of the White House that wants to see much deeper reforms of the intelligence community, notably the CIA. And indeed, a few moments ago, Sean Spicer, the White House press secretary, said this. There's grave concern the president has about the release of national security and classified information. Think the CIA system needs to be updated. 
Um, the CIA system needs to be updated gives you the absolute clue uh, to the way the White House sees all of this. Indeed. We'll get back to you in just a moment. But, Tyrus, let me come to you, um, especially in this particular context, because the, the, the thing about cyber weapons is that they're not like, it's not like a nuclear bombshell, right? It's not like a nuclear warhead which requires quite a bit of expertise in order to manage a teenager in a bedroom somewhere in the middle of nowhere in Kenya can take these tools and use them for pretty much anything they want to do. Very true. Um, so when you saw this initial reports and the data, were you surprised? Um, to be quite frank, Rama, no, I wasn't. Um, the reason is that this is actually the third largest leap that we've had within a span of three years. Remember that back in 2014, we had a company called Gamma mm -hmm. who had about 40 gigabytes of data leaked. Mm -hmm. uh, 2015, we had the hacking team. Last year, we had NSO and shadow brokers. So yeah. this seems to be a trend um, whereby you know, foreign nationals and contractors are being fought against by people who believe that you know, some of these things should come to a stop and that people should know exactly what some of these oppressive governments but just, are doing. But just give, put this into context for us, because not everyone understands the cybersecurity business right. in, in Toto. But a lot of these tools, the malware, the penetration software, um, the, the phishing software, a lot of these things can be bought, essentially bought and traded That's true. on the dark web, That's true. aren't they? Yeah. Yes, they can. And it's, it's a growing market. It's a growing market, and there's need for it, and there's demand for it. But that's, that's the interesting part. This demand that we're talking about, because there was a report that you were part of, uh, yeah. I believe it was last year, put out by Siriano, that talked about cybersecurity across Africa. Mm. One of the things that it did mention was that in Nigeria, losses attributable to cybercrime, $550 million. True. In Kenya, with an even smaller market, smaller economy, $175 million, it sounds like we're just walking blindly into this era of cybercrime. That's true. And um, one of the things that I highly attribute that to is the fact that I think we, we move pretty fast in, when it comes to innovation, but we forgot how to secure it. So security is always an afterthought. And that's why you find that most of our financial institutions are greatly at risk, whereby mm -hmm. we have lots of money being siphoned out of accounts, and uh, we realize when it's too late. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, let's talk about zero-day vulnerabilities. You know what it is, I know right. what it is, but a lot of our viewers perhaps may not know that. Right. Give us the, the layman's definition. What is zero-day vulnerability? So a zero-day vulnerability is a, is a loophole that is available in the software and hasn't been figured out by the provider of the software. And um, a hacker finds out about that loophole and takes advantage of it. So they use that to hack you or to hack any of your systems. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly, in very simple terms, what a zero-day is. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's essentially the same sort of stuff that was used for things like Stuxnet. For exactly, example. exactly. So what they did is that they discovered that the provider of the hardware, who was Siemens mm -hmm. back then, um, had a vulnerability wh which they didn't know anything about. And they went ahead and took advantage of it and they were able to control the nuclear warheads in Iran. Right. Um, one quick follow-up question before I go back to Daniel. How concerned should people be about this information, the tools that have been made public? Yeah. Because it, it sounds, I mean, when you dig deeper into the details of the tools that are being used here, like the CIA would essentially try and um, acquire the data before right. it's encrypted, yeah. not when it's essentially in transit. So it, it does seem that at face value for these tools to work, they do need to some extent have physical access to your device or That's you true. as a person. Yeah. So ideally what I'd say is that um, for a great number of people, and this is, um, this is where we, it's a catch-22. So you know where we say that if you have nothing to hide, you don't have anything to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, not everyone is zero day worthy, um, you know, for any, uh, you know, government agency. Yeah. So they'd probably be going after very targeted people, very specific people. Mm -hmm. So for the common person, so you and I who are probably just normal users of technology, so all we need to do is probably patch up our, our computers, update our software, and that will guard us against some of these zero days because there are good people who provide information regarding zero days to the providers and the providers go ahead and patch them up. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to um, being targeted and being a zero day worthy target, then I don't think there's really much we can do yeah. because we don't even know um, how many of these devices we are buying already have some of these backdoors. Um, and zero days are pretty pricey, aren't they? Yes, they are. They are. They go for a range of about 10,000 to about half a million years done. Okay, that's a ton of money. Um, right, one last question to you, Daniel, uh, if I may. What's, despite his testy relationship with the intelligence uh, community, what's President Trump's position on, on cyber weapons? Would he, for example, make use of a highly targeted um, bit of malware like Stuxnet to, to a greater degree or the same degree that the Obama administration did when it was targeting Iran's nuclear program? I think to answer that question, I want to explain the difference between domestic and foreign surveillance and why that's currently problematic. Say, for example, the FBI is looking at a domestic drug ring. 
and they want to go to, to investigate phones and computers and the rest of it. They have to go to court and get authorization to do that. Say, though, there's uh, it is suspected uh, intelligence work being done uh, by individuals in this country uh, and they are communicating with foreign actors. They then go to the NSA or the CIA and they say, look, we think there's a foreign uh, ring here. We, we suspect something. They no longer have to go to the court in the same way they do domestically. This is one of the fundamental issues, the ambiguities that we currently have. If you are uh, investigating people domestically uh, and it happens to involve some foreign actor, essentially then you are uh, mixing the ground between the FBI and the CIA and the NSA. And that's the situation we currently have. And that's the situation that the White House is currently unsatisfied with. So they have to uh, uh, find better ways of uh, working out the boundaries between foreign and domestic in order to have a more functional system. But to answer your question, I have no doubt that the Trump administration would be willing to use tools like Stuxnet, Stuxnet moving forward in order to target foreign adversaries. Indeed. We'll leave it there for the time being. It's been a fascinating conversation. Uh, Daniel Rangers, of course, live in Washington, D.C. And, of course, Tyrus Kamahi in studio with me. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time.